So the reason I wanted to save about 20 minutes was um, to talk to you about um, talk to you about something that's uh, purely quantum mechanical, for which you have uh, no real um, no real analogs and it um, no real classical uh, comparison to com compare to. And I haven't read your textbook section yet, but it ought to relate to where it covers electron spin. It ought to relate to that, read about it. But I want you to talk to you a little bit about um, more abstract consideration that um, uh, we haven't actually even mentioned yet. So the thing that we haven't even mentioned yet is um, all these wave functions that we are talking about, how many particles are we describing? Just the one, right? In fact, do you remember us dealing with more than one particle in any bound state consideration? No, right? When we were dealing with the infinite square well, it was still one particle. Um, hydrogen atom. In fact, the reason we only talk about hydrogen atom and never helium atom is that helium atom has one too many electrons. We can deal with one. Two is a little bit too many. So we don't really deal with that. But I mean, but helium atom exists. So there are some considerations we have to deal with. So I guess um, it's probably easier for me to just to give you the conceptual idea in the context of infinite square well of non-interacting particles. <laughs> As in, um, we assume that these particles have zero charge. So let's say you have an infinite square well. So um, I want you to ignore for now, if these particles have zero charge, how am I confining them to a square well? <laughs> but you know, ignore that for now. Um, so if we have a single particle, then you know what kind of state this single particle can have, right? You've seen this before. Psi n is equal to some normalization constant times, um, so let me define my coordinate axis. x equals 0 here, x equals l here. It's just a times the sine of l, oops, no, pi x n pi x over l. Right? Remember that? Yes? Um, what if, um, so the question is, all right, so that's one particle in an infinite square well. What if we have two particles? I mean, you could say, all right, the second particle here, I think it's going to be described by the same wave function. You know, psi of n2 is equal to a uh, times the sine of n2 pi, I guess, x2 position of that particle over L. Like that probably would describe that particle, right? Yeah. Now here's the question. Um, what if I want you to describe the whole system? What if I want you to describe the whole system in a single wave function? Psi of position of particle one, x1, and psi of x2, position of particle 2. And this is something that you, know, you wouldn't know the intuitive answer to. The mathematical procedure for doing this, uh, describing a multi-particle system, is actually quite simple. It's uh, taking um, these individual particle wave functions, and you just multiply them together. This is simply equal to psi n1, x1, times psi n2, x2. That's it. Separable um, solution of, um, I guess uh, the way you imagine doing it is you first write down the, the Schrodinger multi-particle Schrodinger equation, and um, this is separable solution um, is the solution for that multi-particle Schrodinger equation. So it's pretty simple, right? You can deal with the multi-particle systems this way. Now, this is where um, some people thought about this for the correct amount of time and thought about an issue that was really never an issue in classical mechanics. So imagine you have these two cards. 
So I'm still dealing with a two particle system. And um, so these two cards are somehow interacting. You know what? I probably should get a uh, track. I'll be right out. <laughs> I was going to just have them collide on the table, but they're just going to horribly miss each other. So. So uh, I want to try to get a correct demo. So all right, I have two cards. So suppose these two cards are interacting here. One card comes in, collides, another card goes up. Right? So would you say that, car, let's call this card one, card two. Would you say card one came in, and then card two went out? Like, how do you know that? So imagine it from um, experiment, oh, so I guess one way you can say, so I'm looking at it. Card one came in, stopped, card two went out. Now, you know that kind of thing is not realistic in quantum mechanics. You cannot constantly observe something, because then you are constantly disturbing it. You are constantly affecting its state. So you, know, you can't do that. You can make measurements at some particular interval, so it's not constantly. So let's say you, uh, one snapshot that you observe is a cart one coming in. And another snapshot that you observe is one cart going out. How would you know that it was cart two that's going out? Because initially it's visionary in the So if you are making those, how do you, how do you know this didn't happen? You know, if uh, you know you close your eyes for two seconds, so you saw this cart coming in. And you know you saw this card going up, but you know in the meantime I lifted this and put it back in, so they never actually interacted. Like, how would you be able to figure out that that didn't happen? No. So I mean, imagine this. Okay. So look at this snapshot. And okay, snapshot one, snapshot two, two A. Compare that with the, okay snapshot one, and snapshot two B. Snapshot 2b looks pretty much like a snapshot 2a if you're looking at momentum and energy. Like, uh, we're talking classical mechanics. So in classical mechanics, what would you do to make sure that you can figure out, is the outgoing cart cart 1 or cart 2? Label it. Yeah, you would label it. So in classical mechanics, that's the underlying assumption that two objects, you could say that they have the same mass. You could have say that they are identical. But at some point, they are distinguishable. It, the assumption is that you can always, all right, call this cart one. Call this cart two. And no matter what I do, now that you have labeled it, you can tell if I did this. Because you will see, oh, it's my cart one that's going up. So, this assumption that you can always label things breaks down when you get into microscopic world of quantum mechanics. What would you label electron with? Spin. Now, spin is a property that can change, right? Spin of a, uh, just like momentum of a cart can change, spin of an electron can change. It can you know, spin up or spin down. It can flip through interaction. So what would you label the electron with? You don't need, so you know, when, you, when people, when um, like doctors uh, trace particular chemicals, how they are metabolized through your body, they uh, tag it with isotopes. Yeah. Um, so you need something smaller than an electron to label the electron with, and you don't have that. So this idea of totally, completely indistinguishable particle is a purely quantum mechanical idea. And it's an idea that has to be taken seriously. In Seriously, for the reason I think I can finish explaining in a minute. Um, so this is what it means. When you have total wave function like this, it needs to obey a particular kind of exchange symmetry. Meaning, um, if, I, if I swap the particle identities. So um, in this particular case, what that would mean is I take this number here, Position of particle one, I swap it with this here, position of particle two. 
So if I wrote this, psi n1 x2 times psi n2 x1, this has to be equal to this. Um, this so the, the idea that this is a condition that must be observed is exchange symmetry. And this is a foreign idea to classical mechanics. Like, why would you expect that? But in quantum mechanics, where in your theory, you build in the fact that your particles are indistinguishable, this is a reasonable requirement. That unless um, your wave function didn't change when you did this, then like something's wrong with your theory. Like uh, it's like this is a symmetry operation. It's a, a symmetry operation like rotation, mirror, translation. So it's a symmetry that must be obeyed. And now when you look at this general function, I mean this is obviously not true. They look different. <laughs> and when I actually put in the actual function forms, it, that also looks different. Because n2 times x2 is not, um, you know, n2 times x2 is not equal to n2 times x1, right? So, so, um, so even though this is a way to build up a multi-particle wave function in general, when you start thinking about the fact that the quantum mechanical particles are indistinguishable, this starts to uh, starts to break down, and um, you need to have a um, you need to have a way of constructing wave function so that um, so that they uh, so that the your wave function obeys this exchange symmetry. Let me show you um, one example of that. I can actually use this as a starting point and build you this uh, symmetric wave function. So let me. All right, I'm staring at this and I have some ideas. Let me try out that idea. This is what I'm going to propose. Is my symmetric wave function x1 x2 is equal to well uh, so the, my problem is that when I swap these two it becomes an entirely different thing right hmm, let me try it this way psi n1 x1 so it's the same thing psi n2 x2 and then I'm going to add this to something that will help the overall thing become symmetric plus psi n1 x2 psi n2 x1. Does this have, um, is this symmetric under particle exchange? Right? Because when I exchange, this becomes that, and this becomes this. So the overall sum is symmetric. So this is a wave function that obeys uh, exchange symmetry. This is a symmetric wave function. All right, um, while we are on this, let me show you one more thing. I can build what's called the anti-symmetric wave function. Um, so let me just write out what my anti-symmetric wave function is. So this is my anti-symmetric wave function. I mean, you know, in my, <laughs> it's poorly motivated why I'm doing this. Uh, it's because I want to explain something. This is my anti-symmetric wave function. Um, psi n1 x1 times psi n2 x2. And this time, instead of adding, I'm going to subtract psi n1 x2 psi n2 x1. Can someone explain what I could have possibly been by anti-symmetric? Kind of like odd function, where so it's sort of like when you take this anti-symmetric um, wave function, and you take it through a particle exchange. It's a, you know kind of a complicated exp um, operation, right? Change x1 to x2, x2 to x1. It's not just flip the sign. When you do particle exchange, you get minus of that wave function. So just like all the function is a kind of a symmetry to a function, not every function is even or odd. There's functions that are neither even nor odd. This is a two different kinds of symmetric wave function. Even kind of symmetric or symmetric, 
odd kind of symmetry or anti-symmetric. So now what's the difference between these two? Um, do you, let's see. Uh, I don't. I think I'm kind of running out of time. So uh, you know, anti-symmetric wave function is kind of almost as symmetric as this because we have this um, convention that what physically matters is uh, the wave function absolute value squared, right? So when you do particle exchange, and if the only thing that changes is the sign, then nothing that matters actually changed. That's why anti-symmetric is also considered a kind of symmetric. And this is where, with the one minute and a half remaining, I want to mention the, the terms of uh, two terms that you may have heard before. The idea of fermions and bosons. How many here have heard the phrases fermions and bosons? OK, not enough of you. These are just the names. Um, I can tell you what distinguishes fermions from bosons. This is not something I can drive. I just have to tell you. Um, the symmetric um, or the, the symmetric exchange symmetry, this is obeyed by bosons. The anti-symmetric kind of symmetry, exchange symmetry, this is obeyed by fermions. But um, that's not the actual definition of a boson and fermion. Um, boson and fermions are distinguished by, the, by their spin. So, um, so I guess I'm running out of time, so I'll just give them the English description and we'll talk about them more probably on Thursday, maybe in the lab. Bosons have what's called integer spin. That means the magnitude of their spin is an integral unit of h bar, like h bar, for example. Photon is an e a boson. Photon has an integer spin, h bar. Um, fermions have what's called half integer spin. So most common example of the spin um, is, I guess this is the kind of uh, spin version of L is h bar over 2. It's kind of weird. L can never take uh, half integer values. Spin can. And it's kind of because spin is a quantum mechanical thing for which there is no classical analog. <laughs> um, so electron spin comes in half integer spin. So electron is a fermion. And finally, here's, the, here's why this matters. When you look at the whole symmetric versus anti-symmetric wave function, imagine that these are your quantum numbers, n1 and n2. When you look at the symmetric wave function, is it OK for you to have n1 equal to n2? Is that OK for your symmetric wave function? Right? It's all right. n1 equal to n2. So n, 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 n. Oh, so I guess I get two of this. So all right, that's fine. So if you have bosons, two, bo two uh, indistinguishable bosons can share same set of quantum numbers. Look at the anti-symmetric wave function. What happens if n1 is equal to n2? Yeah, if this is n, 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 n. Oops, they cancel each other out. So fermions, two indistinguishable fermions, cannot share the same set of quantum numbers. And this is um, the reason behind what you've been taught as um, what you've been taught as the Pauli exclusion principle in chemistry. And this is the more fundamental reason for it. There's still a bunch of pieces that I kind of glossed over, like, you know, what are these and where, why they are defined this way. That requires uh, relativistic quantum mechanics to explain, so that's more graduate level quantum mechanics, even I don't fully understand. So I won't get that far. But this is the more fundamental reason behind the Pauli exclusion principle, why no two electrons in an atom can share the same set of quantum numbers, because electrons are fermions. 
That means they obey anti-symmetric kind of exchange symmetry. That means their quantum numbers cannot be the same. 